And now, Chewing the Fat Summer Sports Show with your host with the most, Bevan Jones. We have a star today. That is the man himself, Graham Studley Corns. He's a 1973 Premiership player with Glenelg, two-time Premiership coach. He's also an Australian Football Hall of Famer and a South Australian Football Hall of Famer. Got his own show on 5AA called Conversations with Cornsy. Cornsy, great to have you on Chewing the Fat. Well, thank you for having I'm not sure I'm worthy. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like being inducted as a Hall of Famer for the Australian football and South Australian football? Well, that was difficult because um, I've, I've, I've had this thing about halls of fame, which, I, which I'm a little bit anti, um, because it's not ever about one player. You know, we, in, 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 footy, in, in Australian rules footy, you've got a team. When I played, there was 20. Now there's 22. And I've always had the, uh, the philosophy that player number one is as, is, uh, as important as player number 22, or vice versa, player number 22 in my day, player number 20 is as important as player number uh, number one. And like in our 73 grand final, which you mentioned then, uh, player number 19, John Sandlin, came off the bench and kicked four goals. Player number 20, Craig Marriott, came off the bench and kicked the ball, which I eventually marked, to, to kick the goal that put us in front. So uh, this concept of elevating one against uh, over others has always been uncomfortable for me and I've, now I'm in three halls of fame, the Glenelg one, the Sanford one and the Australian Football Hall of Fame. So I always thought in my own, you know, me my meandering mind that if I was ever offered that, I might think about, uh, you know, rejecting it, you know. <laughs> but when I actually got the letter, that, that evaporated, that sentiment evaporated in, uh, in a split second really because it's, it's uh, a compliment to South Australian footy as much as anything. It's a compliment to the Glenelg Footy Club. It's respectful of respectful of my, my family. So, so um, it was a massive thrill, a massive thrill, particularly when you consider the the players who are still not in a Hall of Fame who deserve to be there. No, look, I'd say all but there's one or two in the Australian Football Hall of Fame whose credentials I would query. But everybody deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. There's just so many others who deserve it as much. So that's why I've always, when I've been asked, would I sit on a Hall of Fame selection committee? I said, no, I, I will not sit in judgment of peers or guys I played against. Um, but it was, but you know, it was a big thrill, and it re and it remains a big thrill. Now, obviously, uh, winning the 1973 Premiership and the two as a coach as well, um, pretty special moments. But what are some of the other highlights of your career as a coach and a player, Graham? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start, maybe? <laughs> First game's always a big deal, you know. Yep. You know, I was a kid playing footy in Wyala. I was 19, I turned 19, and I was <laughs> nearly given football away to go surfing. We, we thought we could be surfers in Wyala by driving down to the coast, but... But anyway, the Glenelg invited me down and said, come back at the end of the season, we'll give you a run in the reserves. Well, they didn't give me a run in the reserves. They put me straight into the league team. So <laughs> we played Sturt at only Oval, the reigning premiers. Glenelg had finished bottom the year before. We beat them in that game. Norwood lost uh, on the day they were playing, which means Glenelg went into the finals. We couldn't, couldn't miss out on the finals. So that was a big deal. Um, you know, the first Crows game was a massive... Uh, experience, you know, particularly the way that panned out. Our first preliminary final with the Crows, you know, the um, the the '85 Grand Final at Glenelg when I was coaching, that was that was a relief. That wasn't a thrill. '86 was more was more satisfying, I, I think. And a couple of the State of Origin games, we you know we beat Victoria on the MCG in 1993, which hadn't been done since 1963, basically. Um, and that team, that 63 team, has been elevated into the South Australian Sport Hall of Fame. Well, I've often thought, you know, that, that 93 team had to do it on the MCG in really tricky conditions. I don't ever think they've got the, the recognition they deserve. So there's lots of them. I mean, there's, then there's odd games. It was a game at Nord Oval where we, where we won the game after the siren. And, you know, it, there's, you know, when you talk, the you know, games come flashing back, which is... Uh, yeah, pleasant. And you touched on it before, the 1990 uh, was of course when the Adelaide Crows first came into the AFL in their first season. Must have been a, a thrill for you being the first ever coach of the Adelaide Crows. Wasn't a thrill, no. No? Um, <clears throat> it was an honour that I, 
that I realised I had to um, accept <coughs> and live up to. There was enormous responsibility because of all the drama with Port Adelaide and, excuse my voice much, <laughs> with all the drama with Port Adelaide that had led up to the formation of the Crows. So, and we had to assemble a, a squad first and then pare that down into a team or get that down to a team of 52 and as well as having a team that was going to be competitive we had to secure young players for the future that's why you know guys like Ben Hart and Sean Wren and Mark Rusciuto and, and uh, Simon you know you'd like young guys who'd, who'd never really played much for you they were included in those squads so um, it was a it was a big responsibility and and I want to make the point, I don't think the point's made often enough. Those guys who are in the first Crows squad, those 60, 70 players who assembled there in you know, the first week of November of 1990 and were confronted with a training regimen that they'd, they'd, that they'd never experienced before. They trained 13 days out of 14. They had three weight sessions in the morning. Um, and they trained right up to Christmas, which can, that training block can, concluded with that now the infamous 110, 100 metre sprints which they did so and they did that without any promise of contracts without any um, without any um, recompense for it you know they they did it on the on the hope that they'd get uh, one of those spots one of those f spots in the 52 squad so I can't I don't ever think those guys got enough uh, credit and of course it was paired down to the to the team that played against Hawthorne on March the 21st in 1991 and it was just a great night. And you touched on it before with uh, with Port Adelaide. I have to ask you this question because your two sons were named as power players and you, there was that huge rivalry back in the day between Port and Glenelg, it still is. Um, what was it like though having your two sons representing the ultimate rivals in Port Adelaide? Well, all, you, all of those prejudices and loyalties just fly out the window. If you've, if you've got kids who play sport, um, you, you go and watch them and you hope they do well and you hope the team that they're playing for wins. So if you're a, play, if you're a parent of a, of a young player who's got, going into the draft system, hasn't been drafted yet, it's a terribly stressful time. You know, you, you're not sure, you know, they're going to get drafted, where are they going to get drafted to, will they have a good career? Um, and I was with Chad, I wasn't, we weren't really sure. He'd been spoken to by the West Coast Eagles. Port Adelaide had spoken to him. Um, and it was, it, was, it was ironic, given the... It was, it was more than a rivalry between Glenelg and myself and Port Adelaide. It was, it was, a, it was a real hatred to be in that, towards the end of 1990. And, uh, but luckily, Alan Stewart, who was their recruiting manager at the time, he saw through that. He looked at Chad as an individual player. And, and we were away at the time, and the, my sports director at 5AA rang and said, well, the draft's about to start. I'll ring you in half an hour and let you know where Chad has been drafted to. Well, he ran back in seven minutes. He said he's gone to Port Adelaide. <laughs> I said, you're <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Can you cut that out? Yeah. <laughs> 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 just so that was a big deal, and, and uh, like it was it was sort of tough on Chad a little bit because he had to go to Port Adelaide and put up with you know the you know the stigma of the name, but um, but he settled in and made his way. But then Kane, I mean, Kane the same deal. He got drummed, and that was just hilarious. They but he, they ended up there, but as it turned out, it was probably much better for them to go to the Port than the Crows, and. Um, they stayed in Adelaide, they played together, they both had great careers and both are premiership players and all Australians so uh, you know I couldn't have worked out and again if I'm honest, if I'm really honest that uh, 2004 premiership day was one of the one of the great days of our family really enjoyed it. Oh well done Corns, that's yeah. amazing now yeah. we spoke about this before your show, your conversations with Cornsey where did this all come about and tell us all about it for the listeners out there that don't know anything about it I know it's from uh, 3 o'clock every Monday to Friday on 5AA so have a listen in but tell us more about the show well it was recorded uh, and we only do two new ones every week it sounds like I'm on every day that I'm really busy but I'm not <laughs> but you know, years ago back in maybe 2006 um, we, we fiddled with it. I, I wanted to do a little bit more, and the station management at the time allowed me to have 
and half an hour program and we we did a like a little pilot study of it we did i did about half a dozen interviewed interesting people peter fitzsimons you know, terry Britton from the twilights uh amanda vanstein and uh, you know some and i really enjoyed it but the program never went anywhere there was never any spot for it. they just used it to to fill gaps in programming and i and i didn't think any more about it and then richard feidler came out with conversations which, which i thought he's pinched my he's pinched my concept <laughs> But I'm a huge fan of Richard Fyder, don't get me wrong. Um, and then uh, a year or so ago, when I, I retired from full-time at Double A, and I, I was just doing little spots, as you might wear, like Monday night, occasional Saturday mornings, and the program director said, would you like to do those conversation programs again? We'll make it an hour. And I, because I really enjoyed it, and it was a different, it was different than just sport, um, I jumped at it. So I, I, I've enjoyed it. It's working well at the station, so um, and it's not particularly arduous. And I've met some some really inspirational people. So, and speaking of five double A, you're back with your sparring partner <laughs> again, KG Cunningham. How's that going for you? Oh God, I need a, I need a medal. <laughs> 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 no, look, we worked together for 17 years, and it was great. I only had one argument, and um, oh, one one serious argument. We had arguments on air, of course, but. And it was a shock to me when he was, you know, when they moved him sideways, or moved him, when they, or sacked him, if I can be crude, blunt. Um, none of us saw it coming. Well, he says he did. You know, he's the most nervous, apprehensive uh, person who lacks confidence. And he's, every, every year he's saying, oh, I hope I'm going to be sacked. I said, you might be sacked. We're rating number, we were rating, consistently rating number one even against Hamish and Andy, like we, we were a syndicated, where they were, they were they were one number one nationally. So, but they did. I mean, they moved him on, and um, to have him back on Saturday morning, it's like it's like he was he's never been away, to be quite frank. And he's he's not young anymore, but he's still a professional. He works home like a nine o'clock program on a Saturday morning. And first, he got in at five forty-five a.m. <laughs> I said, you're kidding. By <laughs> 45 a.m., Michael Keelan wasn't even there for the six o'clock <laughs> gardening program. <laughs> I mean, he's a good guy, KG. He's a really good guy, and uh, it just at all hasn't worked hasn't worked out for him because he I mean, he lost Sandra, um, and and he should never have been sacked here, in my opinion, anyway. But um, but he's back, and we're, it's a Saturday morning. I know it's not very much, it's only a couple of hours a week, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, good on you. And just finally, season 2019, it's going to be a big one for the Crows and Port. How do you see them both going, Causey? Could they both play finals? Well, they could. I think the Crows are, the Crows seem to be nicely positioned. We've, been, we've avoided all the controversy from, from last summer. Uh, looks like everyone's fit. We don't have any problems with injuries. Or we, I say, say we. They don't have any... I am an ambassador for them. <laughs> um, so hopefully... but. The, uh, they, their midfield still concerns me. They need more midfield midfield drive. They need a, a bit more run and pen, penetration outside. Now a couple of the young kids they drafted are uh, quick and uh, kick long, so hopefully that helps. That defence looks reasonable. Uh, forward line looks okay if they go good, if, if they get good supply, but all depends on the midfield. I, you know, I, I tipped them to make the eight. Point Adelaide, I'm concerned with. I mean they've. The couple of their playmakers have gone. Pollock, Wingard, um, uh, the young fella from the, the left footer. What's his name? Um, Jasper, Jasper Pittard. He, but I know, I know he's he was he he was he had a, had a few flaws in his game, but he did get drive and he did he did, he did get the ball into the forward line. They have to fix their game plan. They've got to get they've got to be able to get the ball into their forward line quickly. They've got to get a balanced forward line with um, Charlie Dixon as a figure point, figurehead as well. I understand they're moving Jack Watts up the ground a little bit to, to perhaps get a bit more penetration and, and run. I, you know, if I had to put my house on it, I can't see Port making the eight. Yeah. I'm happy to be proven wrong, except if I had my house on it. But, <laughs> but um, I just, I mean, I can't see that they've improved their 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 team. But we'll wait and see. I mean. These predictions are so easy to make and nobody really knows.
Yeah, exactly right. It's still a long way out as well. So, well, Graham Corns, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Chewing the Fat today. Cut it, cut it Thank down. you so much for your time, <laughs> no, mate. No, you don't mean that. No, of course <laughs> I do. <laughs> Good on you. See you.